Good afternoon and welcome to the MIT Alumni Career Lunch and Learn webinar series. My name is Ellen Stahl and I run the MIT Alumni Career Programs here at the Alumni Association and will serve as host and moderator for today's workshop. Our webinar is being broadcast live and we will be collecting questions from you throughout the presentation. Please type your questions in the chat box on the lower right side of the WebEx window. This webinar is being recorded and we will upload the uh, webinar and it will be available one week from today on our YouTube channel. A few technical notes. We have several hundred people on our online audience today, which is wonderful. And due to the large group, you are all muted and can only ask questions via the chat box provided. If you can see the presentation but cannot hear the audio, Try using your phone to dial into the audio portion instead of using your computer. I've placed that into the chat box window right now. Our presentation today is the perfect career fit, career design back to the future. This webinar is scheduled from 12 o'clock to 1 o'clock. We will hear from our presenter until about 1245, at which time we will open our Q&A portion of the program. Please type your questions into the chat box at any time during the webinar. You do not need to wait until the Q&A segment. Before we get started, it is my pleasure to introduce you to our presenter today. We are extremely fortunate to have with us Anne Guo. Anne is an alumna of MIT, graduating with her bachelor's in course six in 1998 and her MEng in 1999. She is a career executive coach who specializes in helping high achievers blast through career roadblocks and reach a sustained state of flow. No stranger to career transitions herself, she has gone through artificial intelligence research, software product management, entrepreneurship, and executive recruiting to arrive at her current profession as coach. In addition to coaching clients one-on-one, -on -one, she is the founder of two career-related startups. With her newest startup, Passion Analytics, she is developing an automated online career coach that integrates deep career expertise with advanced analytics in order to help people at scale. And welcome, and thank you for sharing your expertise with us today. I hand it over to you. Thanks, Alan. Very excited to be here today, and I'll dive right in. Um, so the topic talk today is how to design a perfect career fit. And in order to understand how to design the perfect career, we want to first understand what are the real barriers to achieving that goal. So according to the most recent Gallup poll, roughly seven out of 10 workers don't feel engaged in their jobs. And as you can see on the chart, the most educated workers are the least engaged. So the question is, why are so many smart people unable to find fulfilling careers, right? It boggles me. Um, and to answer this question, I want to first share with you an experiment conducted by psychologist Martin Seligman back in 1976. So he took two groups of dogs, and my apologies in advance to dog lovers in the audience. Um, in the first group, a dog was put into a cage and given some electric shocks at random. And there was a lever in the cage, and if he pushes on it, he can get out and the dog quickly learned to push on the lever and escape the shocks. In the second group, same setup, except there's no lever to press. And they were uh, given shocks, and, and, but they were trapped. There's nothing they could do. And after this initial phase, the experimenter then took the two group of dogs um, and put them into bins. So the first group of dogs, when they were shocked, they quickly jumped out like normal dogs would. But the interesting happened when they took the second group of dogs and put them into a bin. And even though these bins were these, you know, obviously shallow thing they could escape from, they didn't. The dog just stood there and endured the shots. The dog in group two had learned that it's helpless in avoiding shocks, so it gave up trying even in situations that it can control. And this phenomenon uh, is called learned helplessness. Now this may give some clues to um, why there's so many people suffering silently in this you know, pandemic of job malaise, right? 
And when I hear stories of what my clients have gone through, it's it's actually quite heroic, the amount of pain that have endured at uh, ill-fitting jobs. And these include uh, weight gain, weight loss, hair loss, teeth grinding during sleep, sleepwalking, insomnia, anxiety attacks, and depression. And just like the dogs in group two, over time, they've learned there's nothing they can do to make things better. And after a while, many of them give up. So you may ask at this point, okay, so I get it. If I don't get good career results after I try a bunch of things, then I may get into this learn helplessness state, right, and believe there's nothing I can do. But why didn't the things I try work in the first place? You know, I'm smart. I tried a good number of things. You know, why are so many smart people unable to find uh, fulfilling careers? Well, here are three reasons why it's so hard to find a perfect career fit. And all of the reasons point to the fact that career design is a much more complicated problem than we give it credit for. Um, the first reason why it's so hard to find a perfect career fit is that the space of careers has become very complex, especially over the last 30 years with uh, globalization and technological advances. And jobs are becoming increasingly specialized. You know, just think about all the fields related to computers alone, right? There's computer networks, computer engineering, graphics, big data, user interface design, security, IT. It goes on and on. Um, now, in contrast, back in the 1960s, there were probably only a, a handful of computer-related uh, jobs, right? So not only there's been a huge explosion in the subfields, there's also been an increasing number of ways to work. Um, between telecommuting, job sharing, solopreneurship, side gigs, um, you know, especially with the rise of Uber, Airbnb, and freelance matching websites, 45 million Americans, or 22% of the adult population, have offered services on a gig platform, you know, as we shift to this on-demand economy. So these two dimensions together create a really large space of career choices, which can be really overwhelming, overwhelming to navigate. Um, but not only that, industries and fields are changing faster than ever before due to what we mentioned, globalization and technology. The future is much less predictable when making a career decision. For instance, you know, when you're thinking about whether or not to go back to school to get that degree and invest all that time, money, energy, it's a much tougher call these days because you know that the industry demands can change while you're in school and the new skills that you gain might become obsolete in a few years, right? So, so in summary, the sheer vastness of the job space plus the uncertainty together create a lot of complexity. So secondly, even though there's been an explosion of complexity in the career space, we're still going about making career decisions in much the same way our parents did, you know. So we lack new concepts and framework to handle this explosion of complexity. And, and here's an analogy, right. Um, so take a guy from the year 1800, and let's say he's a smart guy, you know, top 1% in population. And you stop him at the side of the road, and you say, hey, Giuseppe, I hear you're a smart guy. Please fix my car for me. You know, maybe it's got a dead battery, maybe the engine temperature sensor is malfunctioning. You know, obviously the poor guy has no hope of ever fixing your car because he doesn't have the faintest idea about what these basic concepts are, right? And, you know, if by some miracle he can figure out how to pop open the hood, all he can do is probably just jiggle a few wires and then maybe later kick the tire a few times. And this is equivalent with, of what most people do when they're making career moves. What are these things, you know? Um, so no wonder they didn't get good results. Even if they do make a move and get a new job, if it's not well thought out, it may very well go bad after a few months. And then they're back to where they started, but even more discouraged, right? And then after a few tries to, you know, no better solution, like the dogs in group two, they get stuck in that learned helplessness state and, and then give up. And so here's the third reason why it's so hard to find the perfect career fit. Not only are we lacking theoretical frameworks, the practical execution part of making a career change is also very challenging. Um, so revamping your career midlife can sometimes feel like an impossible task, right? 
um, you know, maybe you have a full-time job plus family responsibility. Even if you don't have a family, you know, there's a, you know, you have a lot of dates you have to go on, right? So you simply can't afford to put everything on pause and go into the mountains and meditate and figure out what will fulfill you. It's almost as if you need to change the engine of your car while you're speeding along the highway and you have to make a complete update in real time, right? So what to do in this case? Now, let me illustrate the analogical way to solve this problem. Um, so imagine that there's a large flatbed truck that slides in the lane smoothly in front of you, right? And extends its ramp down so you can drive aboard. And the resident Formula One pit crew descends on your car and gives you a total engine upgrade. And all the while, the truck is speeding along so you didn't lose any ground. Well, this sounds great, you say, well, what's the catch? Um, well, you have to first build the infrastructure so you can execute flawlessly when you find yourself in a career pinch, right? So that's the catch. Not only do you need good theoretical framework, you also need an infrastructure for smart execution. So now we've gone over the three reasons why it's so hard to find the perfect career fit. And, and I hope you gain a better appreciation for this problem. And I feel like I can almost hear some of you go like, ah, that's why I haven't been able to figure it out. So in part two, let's dive into the how-tos of designing the perfect career. And it's a large topic to cover. In fact, I'll be teaching a three-month online course on the topic. In the next half an hour or 40 minutes, though, I'll cover the main framework and as many of the concepts as I can um, because using the right framework, you'll, it will help you tame the complexity of this problem. Um, so let's dive right in. So first I want to share with you the overall framework I've developed for career design. Um, so we can pose the problem of finding the perfect career fit as, uh, as a search problem, right? So on one end, there's you. On the other end, there's a space of all careers, right? So the search problem we pose is how do we efficiently search through the space of careers in order to identify your ideal career? Now, I want to add that this framework is not limited to career search. Once you narrow down your career, you can use this framework to conduct your job search. And once you're at a job, you can use it to narrow down the list of projects you want to pursue. And even if you're retired, you can use this to um, narrow down the list of uh, opportunities that will be most fulfilling for you. So this is a high-level view, and we illustrate the process and, and sequencing of the actions in the career design, and we'll dive into the individual, uh, individual pieces. Now, you may wonder, well, where do I start, right? Top down or bottom up? Um, if we start bottom up by looking at individual jobs or careers, then on one extreme, right, we can do a brute force search by looking at every single career under the sun. Um, there's actually a comprehensive taxonomy published by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. You can look through every single career there. This will be pretty time consuming. Now, on the other extreme, you can start with too few careers. And this is typically what happens in most people's cases. So senior year in college, right, you look at a set of jobs when, uh, that someone with your degree generally get. You go to the career fair, apply to a few of them, and you take the best offer. Now, this could work, and if you're happy where you end up, that's great. But what if you're not happy with the fit? And there's that nagging doubt, maybe you didn't look through enough options, right? Well, one way to generate some solid options is to start with a top-down approach first. Now, here's the top-down approach. We start from ourselves, again. Um, now, through self-inquiry and doing exercises, we get a better picture of ourselves and what we really want. And I'll show you a sample exercise later just to illustrate what I mean. Essentially, what we're doing is building a model of ourselves. And you can think of this as a specification, right? The, the specification sort of falls out of the, the self-model afterwards. And um, you know, for example, back in grad school, my initial spec was the set of four things. You know, I'm extroverted. I have a computer science degree. I uh, enjoy intellectual stimulation, and I'm a doer who likes to make things happen. Now you have a spec, then you can take the spec and you know, ask, ask around, right? Talk to other people and see what type of jobs might fit. The spec or self-model essentially 
shine spotlights on the space of old jobs. Now, one of the jobs uh, highlighted by my self-model is entrepreneur. Uh, now, here's the full list. But we're not quite done with um, the top-down approach yet because we neglected an important shortcut. Um, so this is true, especially if you're in school or relatively early in your career, right? You haven't had that much experience yet, but oftentimes you're forced to make career choices based on the scan experience and your self-model is already vague and uncertain, in this case, you can bootstrap some job suggestions from other people's experiences through career testing. And, and I want to stress that career testing is not just for young people with no experience. If you are experiencing a lot of uh, misfit with your career and have this feeling that maybe I, I got into the totally wrong place to, to start with, career testing is a really good place to start. Now, career testing generally try to see what type of careers people similar to you have enjoyed, right? So that's a nice shortcut. And when I did some testing, human resources manager and psychologist were some of the careers that popped up. And here's the full list. As you can see, lots of jobs in psychology, and interestingly enough, career counselor was on it. But, you know, unfortunately at the time, I wasn't ready for to be a career counselor. So, so I'll tell you more about my path. Um, so here's the combined list from both the career testing and investigating my self-model, right? And, and here I crammed them all in this diagram on the bottom here in the space of jobs now that we've narrowed down to. Now the next step is to conduct some research and experiments on these actual jobs. So first we'll talk about just research. Um, I narrowed down the list uh, to this four by doing some online research and information interviews. Um, not all of it is, was very well thought out, you know, made tons of mistakes. For example, I had crossed out HR manager right away because the only image of HR I had at the time is, you know, of Toby uh, in the TV show The Office, right? And let's just say I did not identify. Um, but, but funnily enough, a few years later when I was offered a recruiting manager position in the HR department, I remember the HR result from my test which made me more open to that possibility, eventually I accepted the offer um, and led to, uh, you know, a really good career. Now, the psychology result from the career testing really hit home for me. Um, I actually had briefly considered dropping out of the PhD program in artificial intelligence and enroll in a psych program instead. But that will be a pretty big move, right? Years and years more of grad school, just the last thing I, I wanted. Um, so I decided to launch an experiment to test out the hypothesis first. I became a volunteer counselor at the local jail and got training to uh, counsel prison inmates. Um, I still remember on the first day when the guards stepped out of the room, I was really nervous. Um, but soon enough, I felt comfortable with my inmate almost as much as I did with my students that I TA'd in college. Um, it was a really awesome experience and ended up doing it for about a year and a half. On the career side though, um, I quickly learned that while doing counseling work as a volunteer on Sundays is great, um, I would get burned out if that was my full-time job because I had a hard time emotionally separating myself from the challenges my inmates were going through and there were a lot of challenges. Um, so that's one experiment I launched, right? And besides that, I also launched experiment TA in classes. So, you know, I TA several classes actually uh, in grad school uh, to te test out the teaching professor idea. And also I launched and oversaw several undergrad research projects to test out a uh, career as a research professor. And finally, I launched a lotion making business to try out entrepreneurship. I made my own lotions and creams, and this was a kind of a hobby I had on the side anyways and uh, I created educational material to teach other people how to make it. Um, I actually had a business plan, it was all pretty serious. Um, so now each of these experiments allow me to both learn something about the job and to learn something about myself, thereby you know, augmenting my understanding of the career space and also my self model, right? So here is um, the self model and update it. So from teaching classes, I learned that while I love teaching, I'm not passionate enough about computer science to want to teach it for the rest of my life. Um, also, one of my favorite components of teaching was the advising component. 
you know, when students uh, lingered on after office hours and asked me, like, oh, what job should I uh, think about applying for, right, or what internship, or maybe what classes should I take next semester, I really enjoyed the advising component. And from running my lotion making business, I realized that I really enjoy in, uh, entrepreneurship. And um, although the other thing I learned is that I needed a topic that I care more deeply about than making lotion, right? Um, because it's tough to make a business work and it can be really hard to push through the tough times unless you really believe in what you're doing. So now that we have a better self model, it in turn informs and constrains the space of jobs we're searching in and shines spotlights on different set of jobs. So I crossed out psychologist, also crossed out research and teaching professor, kept entrepreneur, then added back in career counselor. Um, so after I finished my PhD, um, I launched uh, a career startup called My Career Tube. Uh, a career video site, and I became a uh, career tech entrepreneur. So that's the first iteration. So now I've uh, taken you through one complete iteration of the process, first going top down and then bottom up, right? So now for the startup, um, after running it for a while, I learned that it just didn't match my risk tolerance at the time. You know, coming out of grad school, I had over 100K of student loan debt and things quickly got really stressful um, as I was running it and not really getting much revenue back uh, or profits for, for that matter. Um, so I moved to software product management. Um, so I started this job in September, I think it was September 14, 15 of 2008 and got laid off less than two months later due to a company rework um, in response to the stock market crash. That was my first job out of school, right? I was also eight months pregnant at the time. You know, for that, the day I got laid off, I was devastated. Um, you know, I then had to build my career in a deep recession with a new baby. And in the years following, I went through online marketing manager, recruiting manager, executive search, running my independent recruiting firm to finally career coach and back to career tech entrepreneur. And I experimented a lot and iterated quickly, so even though I've had my share of bad luck and made tons of mistakes throughout, because I had a tight process, I was able to achieve financial independence while I was still in my 30s, and most importantly, I was able to arrive at an awesome career where I love what I do, right? And also had some fun getting there. Um, so in summary for this process, we start from top down, and then we construct a model of ourselves, and this model spotlight jobs to consider, and then we do research on them and conduct experiments, um, and we keep iterating. And e in each iteration, um, our self-knowledge become increasingly refined, right? So the self-model should get bigger and bigger and more and more refined as we do this. And the self-knowledge then can help us filter and narrow down our job hypothesis set. So the set should get smaller for the most part. It can expand occasionally, but get smaller. And I want to point out, it's, you know, I, I, I said this as a search process, but we can also create jobs in the job set, right? So I was like a, a career tech entrepreneur is something I created. Um, so you can definitely create your, create your own career or job and then put into that set. So now in this iterative process, I want to, um, you know, you can keep track of these four things so that it allow you to make explicitly uh, explicit trade-offs um, uh, and build on your findings, right? And these are the important components of your career infrastructure. Um, so the first thing is your self-model. These are everything you ever wanted, needed, dreamed of, uh, your, your edge, you know, what you're good at, your purpose, et cetera. So the second thing is your current job set. These are the jobs you're wondering about and may, they may have some promise. And this set, again, changes over time as you investigate. The third thing is your list of career questions. And the fourth thing is experiments that you launched to test out careers in the current set, right? So I can't stress enough how important this part is, just writing it all down. Um, you know, I'm always appalled and amazed at how little notes people take around their career planning. Um, it, will be, it will be just like, you know, writing code in your head, right, if you don't do that. 
Um, you know, sure, maybe you're talented and you can write snippets of code in your head, but no one I know can write and debug 10,000 lines of code in their head, right? Um, yet that's what you're doing if you don't take notes on your career, because um, what you're doing is you're hoping to resolve all these complex dependencies in your head, and that's why it doesn't work. Um, so throughout this process, you know, should be asking yourself, you know, am I putting all the questions on my list, right? Am I answering these questions? Uh, am I launching and monitoring my experiments, right? Um, as a rule of thumb, always have at least one experiment going in the background. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about experiments in a bit. Um, so first, regarding the self-model, how do you construct this self-model, right? So there are tons of exercises, inquiries, and uh, that I do with clients one-on-one, -on -one, and usually over a period of several weeks. Um, it's a lot of work, but it's also a lot of fun. So here's one exercise I'd like to share with you. So I call it the seven subpersonality exercise, where you're trying to find uh, a set of seven or fewer subpersonalities that together form a spanning set of you, right? Um, so if you ever had a, a tough career decision to make and found yourself saying, you know, well, part of me want this, but part of me want this other thing, then I think you know what I mean here. Um, so rather than thinking of ourselves as monolithic personalities, for decision-making purposes, it can be more helpful to think of ourselves as a cast of characters. The challenge then is to find the smallest set of personalities that are mostly, you know, orthogonal to one another and in combination max maximally captures your complexity, right? Um, so I had first came upon a version of this exercise on Steve Pavlina's blog, Personal Development for Smart People, and adopt it for career planning purposes. So here's my standing set. A quick note. Um, these should be themes that are pretty persistent throughout your life and manifest themselves in different areas in your life, right? In work, in play, in relationships. Now, looking back, you might be able to see traces of them as early as childhood. Um, now, looking at this list, a lot of things I engage in tra traces back to one or a combination of these subpersonalities. Uh, for example, when I was in grad school doing academic research in AI, the dominant personalities were number one, the student, and the number two, the go-getter, right? Together, they were a powerful combo that silenced most of the other personalities. Uh, my number three, connector, was very frustrated because doing academic research was very lonely and isolating, you know? So what happened is I oscillated between having my mind blown by these cool concepts in AI and feeling lonely and down because I was spending too much time by myself. And that's what happens when your subpersonalities are not working in sync with one another, right? You have this oscillation in energy level. And eventually it can feel pretty draining. Um, so here are a couple of tips when it comes to finding your subpersonalities. Uh, as a rule of thumb, keep it between four and seven, right? If you have too few, it may not capture enough of your, of your richness and too many, they stop being helpful as a decision-making tool, right? And then you're just sort of juggling all these things. Um, so also, give them expressive names that really capture the feeling. Um, at first, I named the indulgent part of myself uh, the hedonist. But it didn't feel right because the word had too much negative connotation, right? So when I, first, uh, when I finally came upon uh, the Roman, which is number five here, it was perfect. You know, so I picture this Roman reclining on the chaise lounge eating grapes, right? And it really captured the essence of what I want to express. And I found that in my stressful corporate jobs later, when I also had a young kid to raise, the Roman was kicked to the curb, right? There was no time to indulge or to relax. Um, and as I said before, when one or more of your subpersonalities are suppressed for too long, it becomes really hard to achieve your goals. Um, because what, what happens is that these subpersonalities start to sabotage us to gain some attention and control, right? It just, it just try to grab control. And the reason to make all of these personalities explicit is so that you can negotiate and create more win-win situations. Um, so for example, you know, I might be working hard, uh, the go-getter might be working hard, right, to create a career talk 
but if I can swing it, I can deliver it at a conference in Italy, right? So the Roman will be happy too. Um, so if you're listening, you know, invite me to a talk in Italy and I'll come. Um, but, you know, seriously though, if you, I really recommend you try this exercise when you get a chance. And if you do, feel free to send me your results um, and at passionanalytics.io. Passion so here are some common career issues, and we can take a look at them in light of our new framework, right? Um, so when there seem to be too many options out there and you don't know what you want, you probably have an under-constrained self model. Your model of yourself is really underdeveloped. In this case, you know, just do lots of self-inquiries and exercises, you know, like the one I showed you before. Um, now the second case is tougher. So the second common problem is there are no options, right? Some of you might already anticipate this as I was talking about, um, you know, constructing your self model. So you say, you know, and it's oh well and good that I learn a lot about myself, but the more I learn about myself that, and more of what I want, the pickier I get, right? And the harder it is to find something that fits everything. You know, doesn't that make my job search harder, not easier? Well, you know, I think you're right in some respects, but, um, uh, you know, I'll talk more about that. So funnily enough, though, most people experience both of these problems um, uh, simultaneously. They both under-constrain themselves and over-constrain themselves. So usually they tend to first under-constrain themselves and then over-constrain themselves. And, and, you know, as a result, they feel like there are too many choices and at the same time, nothing works. Um, well, how can that be the case? Here's an example. Um, so, you know, take a person that says, okay, I want a job that pays really well. And immediately that person jumps to, well, law and finance are lucrative fields. And then he thinks, all right, well, now I don't enjoy tons of reading that lawyers are required to do, um, so I probably won't do well in law school. And also, I'm not really good at modeling, so finance is out. Now, I think I'm simplifying a bit here, but that's the process many, many people go through. And then they end up stuck, right? Because they never really expand their options in the first place. The right way to go about this is to first um, really understand what, what you want the money to begin with, right? To see if there's a need that's more core and, and deeper that could be satisfied differently. Um, if so, great. If not, um, it's time to investigate all the jobs that pay well, right? And then look at our abilities, our edge, our personality, our wants and needs to determine um, what's a good set of job options, right? You know, doing that highlighting in the job set as I showed you before. Um, so then invest all these options, do your research, then launch a few experiments, then learn and repeat. So. Going back to that um, over-constrained uh, self-model part, this is a tough one. I, don't, I want to spend a, another minute on this. So, you know, over time, invariably, as you get better and better self-knowledge, um, your model is going to get bigger and bigger, right? How do you deal with conflict? Um, so now we touched on it briefly when we talked about the subpersonality exercise, right, to, to deal with conflict and things you want. Um, also, the thing to do is to zoom in and figure out what your core wants and needs are and be unrelentingly committed to those. So for example, here are my two core commitments to myself. Um, number one is that I will never work in the capacity where I feel lonely on a daily basis um, because deep connection is very important to me. I remember feeling you know, really lonely when I was in grad school when I had to spend tons of time thinking and coding on my own um, dysfunctional corporate environments can make me feel really lonely as well. Um, also, when I was in a great corporate environment with really cool coworkers, the sheer amount of work can cause, um, you know, just a lot of stress so that all the coworkers, all the cool coworkers don't really have time to hang out together. And that again felt kind of lonely. And for me, this is not acceptable and I'm 100% committed to feel a sense of connection in the work I do. And which is why career coaching is perfect because I get to experience a deep sense of connection on a daily basis when I coach clients. Um, now, my second commitment to myself is that 
uh, it's more of a personal quirk. And I, I talk about here just to illustrate the range of things you can be unrelentingly committed to, right? No matter how silly or trivial it may seem at the time. Um, so this one is, you know, I'm pretty sensitive to the layout of my physical environment. When I'm in a restaurant, for example, you know, I'm the person that always want to sit with my back against the wall facing into the room. And when I'm working, it's the same way. If there's a wall in front of me that's within 15 feet, I feel really restless and I'm less productive. And, and I'll forget cubicles, right? That's just terrible for me. So knowing this quirk about myself, I'm 100% committed not to be in a situation where I have no control over where I sit. And I remember back in one of my corporate jobs, I would go sit in the company cafeteria with my laptop and my coworkers later told me, you know, they were wondering if I didn't like them, right? Um, and this is one reason why I work for myself, because then, you know, I feel like, you know, I'm an adult, I can pick where I sit every day. Um, so while I'm 100% committed to these two core things, over the years, I've also shed some non-core wants and needs that kept making me miserable. So that's the second way to get what you want, right, to shed these non-core wants and needs. And one of them is that for a long time, I felt the need to prove myself by excelling in math and science. And it's probably from a complex of, you know, having an older brother who's good at this stuff and maybe also part cultural. Um, and the problem is, though, the better I got at math and science, the more competitive the environment I got myself into so that I had to work harder and be more heads down and solo and lonely so that over time, you know, after banging my head against the wall many times, I finally decided this want just doesn't serve me, and I worked pretty hard to shed it. And I'm mostly there, you know, not 100% yet. Um, so the third way to get what you want is to improve your ability to get the things you want. Now, this is the thing that smart, capable people jump straight to, right? When they want something, they make, they take classes or do whatever it takes to get good at getting the things you want. But don't forget number one and number two, which are also pretty key. And so we'll talk about number three here, uh, spend a little time here. Um, and this is related to my next point. You know, career design um, doesn't always have to involve career change, right? Um, so, so coming back here, uh, a common complaint is that um, there's, there's not many great opportunities, right? So if you feel um, this at times, then I would say chances are you did not create an opportunity feed or you didn't, you know, experiment enough. And here's a short case study of an alum, John Gavinonis from class of 98, who was a chemistry major. And I use this example also to illustrate, you know, besides illustrating a case study of an experiment, is to illustrate that career design doesn't always have to involve career change. Um, so John is currently a manager of R&D at DuPont, the chemical giant based in Delaware. So while he enjoys his job in leadership position at DuPont, John has an interest in public policy. Um, so if he wanted to, one route to satisfy that interest is to apply for a very competitive public policy fellowship. Um, you would be competing with tens of thousands of applicants for, you know, a number of spots for the opportunity to work on the Hill for a year alongside of a lawmaker. And to do this, um, John will have to pay, uh, take a large pay cut and jump out of the leadership track. So, and it just so happens that he enjoys his current job and being lead, uh, in the position of leadership. So what to do at this point, right? Can John have his cake and, and eat it too? Well, yes. Um, he created the MIT Legislative Advocacy Network. It's a joint effort between the MIT Alumni Association and the DC office. It informs and empowers alumni on legislative issues that impact science policy and education. So if you sign up through your Infinite Connection account, you get an email on average, you know, four times a year when legislative matters affecting science policy and education are being debated in Congress. And, and then they will send you some material to prepare you to email the, your local congressman. And that's it. Um, so here I want to make a plug for Lane for those in the audience who care about public policy issues. You can sign up through your Infinite uh, Connection account. So here, John has uh, designed a, 
uh, great experiment that created many win-win situations, right? And let's just look at these win-wins. By creating Lane, he gets to carry out his interest and test drive it. Um, so John has met at this point several U.S. senators and been consulted on science policy issues. He gets to build his professional network. Uh, number three, by signaling his interest and be plugged into a bigger network, he has created an opportunity feed where if relevant positions in science policy ever comes up, he'll be tapped, right? So rather than starting from the bottom as an intern or, or um, a junior fellow, I won't be surprised if he gets uh, a high-level federal appointment at some point. Number four, he um, also gets to strengthen his position at his current job, you know, by developing a large network of contacts, you know, including these U.S. senators, he makes himself more attractive his, to his current employer, right? And as well as all these learning opportunities from um, knowing all these new people. Um, number five, creating um, a new program to connect alum to the institute also fulfills his volunteer commitments um, sitting on the MIT Alumni Association board. And finally, he gets to make an impact on actual legislation and make a contribution in what he cares about. I want to emphasize here that a good experiment can serve the dual purpose of information gathering and also building your opportunity feed. So I just want to say that again. A good experiment can serve the dual purpose of information gathering and building your opportunity feed, right? So, and, and John's current goal is to sit on uh, some boards of early stage biotech startups and feel free to contact him with opportunities. You see how that works here? <laughs> um, so when I coach clients, one way I think about my role is to help people transform their career search space such that when they're navigating in this space, the downside risk is minimized, right? So there's a lot of risk control there so that the valleys are, are more filled in so you don't far as fall down, uh, as, as far down. At the same time, the opportunities on the upside are amped up so that you're experiencing more fulfillment and satisfaction by doing things that are a better fit. And I also want to stress here that uh, remember that a better career fit doesn't always have to be a new job, right? Just remember John's example. Um, remember this picture from a while back, you know, uh, the beginning of the talk about the complexity of the career space and the vastness of choices? Well, armed with a better framework, you can now use the, um, you can now make the vastness of the choices work for you, right? Because in much of human history, what we do was completely dictated by the station we were born in. Um, you had little choice if you were born in a low caste in 1400s in India or, um, or even a woman in the 1950s United States. So now with all the different job choices and all the different ways we can do them, your chances are better than ever to find that little perfect niche, right, that matches you perfectly. And to deal with all the uncertainty in the job space, that's why we iterate quickly, right? You know, this is starting to remind me of a lean startup here. Um, so, you know, at, at the end of talk, you know, I always want to know when I attend a talk, well, so what can I do, right? So if you find yourself asking that question, here are some action items. Um, number one, the thing, one thing you can do is to write down a list of all your career questions and empty your head of them. And this one is, you know, it looks simple, but it's magical. And I'm willing to bet that if you write them all down, right, like 30, 50, 60 of them, half of them are easy. And then you can probably knock them out of the list within like a period of two weeks if you just write, write all of them down and stare at them. Um, number two is do the sub, seven sub-personality exercise. You know, it's pretty fun, actually. Um, number three is write down your self-model. And you can start by just writing down a list of everything you've ever wanted and dreamed of in your career. Number four, then, is pick one thing from that list of wants that you feel is really core to you and make a real commitment to it. And, and that's no matter how silly or... or trivial it may seem, right? And like for me, it's where I sit every day. Number five, of course, you know, send me your feedback for the talk. 
so that I can uh, keep improving it. Um, you know, so I'll just leave this up for for a second here. Um, so unlike the man from uh, 1800, right, who doesn't know what electricity is, all the quote unquote advanced career concepts here are things you already know. You know, you just need to map these concepts from the world of science and engineering to the career domain. And, you know, because if you have a Twitter account or uh, you have a Twitter feed or a Facebook feed, it's simple to understand what an opportunity feed is, right? Um, so I, I, I like to think that the complexity of fixing your career is similar to that of fixing a car. It's not easy and it doesn't come naturally for most people, but it, and it definitely takes some learning and training but most people can make pretty good progress if given good instructions and if they apply themselves. Career design and career planning, it's, uh, you know, it's really worth investing in because it's a lifelong skill, right? You'll be using to, to guide your career. Um, even after you retire, you can still use this framework to help you figure out projects you want to pursue that bring you um, maximum satisfaction and fulfillment. Um, now the top-down approach we talked about, well, what was that, right? So it's really an exciting process of self-discovery where you get to learn about valuable things about yourself and learn what's core to you and also learn to take a stand and really honoring that core by making an unwavering commitment to it. Um, now bottom-up approach um, where you're exploring the space of careers when done right, it should have the excitement of a road trip, right? Um, as a coach, in the short term, I'd be happy to be your pit crew when you need me. But for the long run, though, you know, I like to teach you the framework and concepts so you can fix the car yourself in case you run into problems on this journey. And if you're interested in a career design online class I'd be teaching, feel, uh, feel free to send me a quick email and I'll show you more info. And at passionanalytics.io. So in closing, I just want to say that a world of adventures awaits you and enjoy your ride. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anne. That was wonderful. I do have a lot of questions to get to, no surprise there. Um, I want to start off, um, we did have a lot of questions about the sub-personalities. Um, mm -hmm. People were looking for lists of sub-personalities, or you mentioned a website for sub-personalities again. Um, is there something that I could put for um, any sort of information on that in the chat box for folks? Uh, list. Um, you know what? In fact, I'm compiling a list of, you know, all the ones I've seen before, and, and people send me this personality list all the time, right? So um, I think the easiest way is, the easiest thing is shoot me an email and I can send it to you, but in the long run, I'll put it on the, uh, my website, passionanalytics.io, and that will be one of the resources, but that Great. will probably take me a little while. Sure, no problem, understandable, understandable. Um, one of the other questions was, in terms of balancing the search for sort of discovery and exploration of one's true job list mm -hmm. versus getting a job after job loss, can you talk a little bit about perhaps the differences um, that people should recognize between those two? Um, well, I mean, I guess you probably could explain it better. I mean, I, I think that you and I know that there is a difference between that um, yeah, versus absolutely. job searching versus really sort of ex exploration for that perfect yeah. fit job. Right, right. So, you know, this reminds me of the, you know, Maslow uh, levels hierarchy, right? So you have to meet your lower level needs, more basic needs of security first before you can, you know, attack the, the thing on the top of the pyramid, which, which is self-actualization, right? So if you're worried about the next job and you're really stressed out, I, I feel like at that point there's no need to be worrying about what's the perfect job at that point. You know, at that point, it's really a matter of thinking about how do I extend my opportunities and thinking about in the short term what to do. But, but here is what people tend to get into trouble. They get into that next opportunity and that job is really demanding, right? And it takes 60 hours and then you have come home, there's, you know, family and other responsibilities. And then you sort of get into this track and then you push off the long term again, right? Because it's, it's a very hairy, big task. And it's very complex. Um, so I think the thing to do is to always have some experiments on the side and launch something so that you can 
um, you know, when you're not in that extreme stress time, right, when you're really having, uh, you know, your, like I experienced this, right, you know, you're laid off and, you know, and, and trying to find a job at the time, it's better to think in that short run, but really make a note to yourself, you know, put it on your calendar, right, to come back after the job search is done to, you know, write down my wants and needs, do the self-model, do the seven personality exercise, and, and continue on that, uh, you know, on that process. Great. Um, so here's one of your favorite questions that I'm sure varies depending on the individual. Um, what's the time frame of the process? So thinking about the self-model, thinking about job space, the testing, repeating, how long does this take? What is your sort of answer that you give to individuals? How, I, I think this takes really three to six months. Um, and, and this, you know, whether or not it includes actually landing the final opportunity, that can take even longer, right? Because you could launch an experiment and that experiment could last a few months. So, but I think the getting the core of um, all these skills and check off all these boxes, I think it takes a few months. I would say three months. Um, and typically when I engage with clients one-on-one, -on -one, I start with a four-month period. Um, and that sort of, um, you know, that's a, a pretty, you know, reasonable timeline. And, you know, the class I teach is three months because I just feel like, you know, people have a lot of other commitments and you want to cram it in as, uh, as quickly as you can. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For a lot of people, they were wondering, I think, you know, sort of starting in those early phases, phases of the process, where do they even start with getting a list of what's out there in terms of job options or job opportunities? Where can they go to research what's out there and available? Mm. So, so I bet that there are actually a lot of answers in your head already, right? If you just um, take out, like, say, 40 minutes of your day, right, and just keep writing, lists, making lists of jobs that anything that pops into your head right, with things you already know, things uh, that people with your degree do, that could be your starting list of jobs um, to look at. And then, I, you know, it depends on what kind of timeline. Are you looking for that perfect, perfect fit ideal job, or you're looking in the short run, right, for the job list? Um, this is one reason why I say that this framework can be used, you know, whether it's a job search or a career search. If you're doing a job search, you just start with the job list. Don't start top down from, you know, all my wants and needs. Start from the list of jobs that you brainstorm, right? And then start doing experiments on those and, and you know, uh, more research on them, right? And asking around, doing information interviews. Um, so, um, so yeah, so you can start with a list that you brainstorm with. And then at, after that, just take your three, um, I wouldn't say smartest friends. I would say most uh, scrappy friends that are, are really kind of entrepreneurial and, you know, they're quick thinkers, are good at brainstorming. Put them together to brainstorm a list for you. And then that will be, I think, a pretty good list to start from. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks. What advice do you have for the long-term unemployed middle-aged job seekers who have, unfortunately, sort of two discriminating factors perhaps against them when it comes to potential job searching age and length of time that they've been unemployed? Yes. I think age discrimination is a very, uh, it's a very tough fact that's out there. Um, so I think in that case, I would think about, um, again, this one is something where you have to build a bit of infrastructure before it can help you, right? And one of the things, um, you know, I, I advise uh, people do is think about um, actually check out the blog, Early Retirement Extreme. So if you just search for Early Retirement Extreme, you can find the blog. It's written by a physics PhD. He basically retired on like a, a physics postdoc salary. And, you know, I, growing up as an immigrant, you know, my, my dad was always, you know, um, pretty frugal. And I kind of developed the opposite tendency. I'm like, I'm not going to penny pinch myself and I want to live a good life. But Lately, though, I think in the last couple of years, I realized there's a lot of merit to that. And it's not just pin and pitching for its own sake, but it's to enable myself to live a free life. The more you can trim down your lifestyle, 
and, and get really into more of a, a sports in doing that, right? Rather than thinking, oh, you know, I'm, I'm really depriving myself. Like if you can make it into more of a game, then you can get into that position and, um, and start doing something to ramp down your lifestyle. So at the same time, though, you want to think about ramping up your opportunities, um, you know, sort of restart your current network. You know, think about who are the people in your network. And I know this is a really tough thing because, you know, when you're unemployed, it's really hard to reach out to your network, right? Because, you know, we feel like, you know, our self-esteem is suffering and, you know, we don't want to be that person that's bargaining everybody. Um, but this is a time to start, you know, reboosting your, your network and thinking about what kind of jobs um, are, uh, are out there to line up. And I think the third component is to really think about how can I bootstrap some energy, right? So I have very little energy and positivity at this point, you know, when, I, you know, I'm doing job search, right? Um, so one thing I do to bootstrap energy is to, um, to watch, like, uh, during breakfast to watch some TED Talks. Um, they're, they're, they're kind of um, like a little energy candy, right, in the morning. Um, so doing things that are uh, quick, painless, but give you a boost of energy. And for you, it might be something else. So engage in more of those activities to, you know, get your energy a little higher so you can tackle this tough problem of job search. Great. So obviously we know that you are a private career coach, um, and people obviously are welcome to contact you for your services. In addition to that, do you have any recommended books or recommended places where people might be able to dabble in any testing that you might want to recommend? Um, yeah, so there's uh, one book by, written by the uh, founder of LinkedIn. It's called uh, The Startup You. That one is really good, so I recommend that one. Um, another one that's really good is um, actually written by my mentor, uh, Nicholas Lohr. He, um, he was one of the early founders of uh, the whole field of career coaching back in the 80s. And now he's in his 70s and, you know, half retired. It's called uh, Pathfinder. Um, oh, I forgot the subtitle part, but it's called Pathfinder. Um, so you should be able to find it on Amazon. If you can, just send me an email. Great. And if people are looking for the slide deck, which has been, of course, the number one question that we knew that it would be, what's the best mm -hmm. way for people? Obviously, we're going to be, we've recorded today's um, session, yeah. and we'll put that up on our YouTube channel within a week. If mm -hmm. people are looking for the actual slides, what's the best way for them to go about that? Um, you can just send me an email, um, and at passionanalyst.io. Um, and then you can watch the talk or, or listen to the talk again on the YouTube channel. Excellent. Thank you so much. I do want to put in a plug for any Boston area listeners out there. Um, our next career event coming up is actually on campus with Dr. Valerie Young on May 3rd. She's going to be doing a talk on the imposter syndrome, 6.30 p.m. at the Stata Center. She's going to be doing a talk, book signing, followed by a dessert reception. If you are around and available, you can register online um, at alum.mit.edu on our career programs page. And thank you so much for this amazing webinar today. I'm sure that people will be contacting you. Um, and for those of you who did listen today, we will, we will be sending out a survey today if you could complete that to help us um, achieve even more um, great career programs here for the Alumni Association and give good feedback to our presenters. And there will also be a link on that for the YouTube channel. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a great afternoon. Thank you, everyone.